Okay, we're about ready for our next talk. So I have a question for you, though. Uh, after, after Jonathan's talk, how much do you like TypeScript? Yeah? 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 It's pretty awesome, actually. Uh, he, he told you what it was and, and why it is. Uh, our next speaker is going to tell you what it's the good parts, what's good about it, why you really want to use it, uh, and maybe what's not so good about it. Uh, this is Jason uh, Denizak, and uh, he's, he's wearing a Cthulhu shirt. That's pretty cool. Anyway. Hello, hello. TypeScript. Hell yeah. All right. Uh, yeah, there you go. So, I, man, I feel like this entire morning has been just the perfect setup to what I want to take the next couple of minutes to talk to you guys about. Uh, we've been hearing a lot about um, problems of modularity, managing complexities in large applications by pretending that there are a lot of small applications. Uh, my screen is kind of falling apart, which is great. <laughs> We've been hearing about problems of discoverability. Node, I think, handles complexity very well by making it very easy for us to decompose our application into a series of very small modules through an excellent package manager ecosystem. NPM is one of the reasons that I really love working with Node because it makes everything just really nice. Um, we, don't need, we don't need visuals. TypeScript, in my opinion, is not a language. It's part of my tool chain that I use and I'm working with JavaScript. I like writing TypeScript because I'm writing JavaScript. My name is Jason Denizak. Uh, I work at a company called Agile Diagnosis. We're a small team. We write medical software. Um, basically, we help doctors practice better medicine. And what I want to talk about is how TypeScript can help developers practice better application composition. TypeScript, the good parts. There are good parts. And thank you, Jonathan, for going over sort of some of the feature set. Uh, and I want to talk kind of more qualitatively about TypeScript. Let me turn on mirroring real quick. What I'm about to show you is very incredible. This represents my company. This is Agile Diagnosis. This is a dinosaur punching, or being punched rather, by, wait for it, <laughs> by, by a setting screen by a robot. <laughs> T-shirts coming soon. <laughs> Why do I care about TypeScript? Why do I care about JavaScript? Why do I care about being able to help programmers practice better code? Because I want us to work on shit that matters. I don't know how well we could see this, but this is a whole bunch of startup logos. Social software, kind of analytics software. Some of it's useful. I think the blogger made the internet better. Here's Wikipedia over here. That's arguably pretty useful. Uh, but living in the Bay Area, a lot of it is just noise, and a lot of it is really dumb stuff. And I want to challenge all of you, if you're not working on a project that you're proud of, quit your jobs. Come work for us. We're doing cool <laughs> shit. A very good characterization I've heard of a lot of companies, especially in the social space, is that they're solving problems for the people in the world with the fewest problems. <laughs> oh no, Uber, I don't like hailing cabs because that requires human interaction and I want the whole thing to be done already and I want them to come exactly to me because I can't walk out into the street. Okay, although if you've ever tried to hail a cab in San Francisco, there's like two, I think, in the entire city. So it makes sense. Uh, but I'm, I'm really proud of being able to work in the medical field. And I don't really come from a CS background or a programming background. My degree is in public policy. So maybe all of you in the room don't need TypeScript because you're all probably a lot smarter than me and you probably type a lot faster too. But TypeScript helps me be very productive. Let me clear up a couple of misconceptions. Who here has heard of CoffeeScript? A lot of people. Uh, anyone heard of Dart? 
All right. Wow, more than I thought, actually. Um, and then TypeScript, of course. And you think they're maybe kind of similar, or they're just kind of like, there are other things that are compiling to JavaScript, other languages that target JavaScript. Well, kind of. Um, does that lead to fragmentation? I've heard the argument a lot that you shouldn't write CoffeeScript because then you're never going to get people contributing to your libraries. And that's probably true. You should probably be writing libraries that you want people to contribute to in JavaScript. But if you're just writing stuff internally on your team, uh, you should be able to write it in whatever you feel like writing. And just because you're writing it in CoffeeScript shouldn't be a barrier to other people consuming your code. I think that TypeScript can do a great job of promoting code reuse. And here's my diagram kind of positioning some of these languages. So in the middle we have good old JS, yellow squares. Over here we have CoffeeScript, which kind of overlaps with some of the features, but like declares uh, a different syntax for you to use, try to make it look like Ruby, uh, which is great, I guess, if you're into that. Um, and then you could always kind of like, it's a leaky abstraction, so you could pipe out to writing just plain JavaScript in the middle of your, of your CoffeeScript, like if you want to tack things onto a global variable, for example. Um, over here, kind of floating over here, you have Dart, which is a bunch of people saying we could do it better, but that's great because Dart is supported what in, in Chromium, uh, which is not everywhere. And then over here you have TypeScript, which is a strict superset of JavaScript. So you can all be TypeScript developers today by gripping through one of your projects and replacing uh, .js with .ts. And you can compile it, and now you have a TypeScript application. So one of the things that's great about TypeScript, especially if you're kind of skeptical, you're like, I don't really need to use this, uh, I, don't, I don't need this, I'm productive enough in JavaScript, why do I need this extra stuff? You don't need to change the way that you write code. And again, TypeScript might not be for you, but I think it can still add a lot of value to the stuff that you produce if anyone else is consuming your code. On altjs.org, there is a growing list of over 130 languages that compile to JavaScript. There's something of a cottage industry right now of a lot of people creating these. Uh, there's, there's things like Roy, which is kind of like Haskell JavaScript. There's ClojureScript. There's um, a lot of innovation going on in the language space targeting JavaScript, compile to JavaScript. Jonathan mentioned that JavaScript is the assembly language, so that comes from Mr. Brendan Eich. This is the most flattering photo I could find of him. <laughs> in a quote that he's been saying recently, saying that JavaScript is the bytecode of the web. So it's not low level in the sense that uh, it's assembly, but it's ubiquitous. So it's like your IL for the .NET platform or whatever Java does for the JVM. You can have different languages that all generate the same interoperable code. And oh hey, in our case, Pure JavaScript happens to be a pretty decent language for writing stuff in directly. So it's, it's a language that is adequate as a target language uh, for transpilers from all these other high-level languages, but it's also pretty humane to write uh, by hand. So that's cool. It's cool because it's everywhere. It's on your phones, it's on your laptops, it's on like your really old stuff, it's on uh, quadcopters, it's wherever you want it. Um, and it's all just JavaScript. So the fact that there are all these languages happening, I think is a really cool thing, and it's not something that we should be intimidated by or that we should be kind of like just totally dismissing. I think that it's really cool to have that kind of innovation, but still have our base JavaScript language that is basically the interoperability layer that makes all this stuff work together. But, 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 but Microsoft, uh, Microsoft has kind of a bad reputation, maybe, and it's interesting to be giving this talk in Seattle, uh, of embrace, extend, and extinguish. Uh, apparently, they tried doing like Microsoft RSS or something. I, I, I don't know. Um, it's Microsoft, but it's the new Microsoft. It's open source Microsoft. So this is, this is one of the things that's really cool, is that the TypeScript compiler, um, if, if you have like a spare hour or whatever, go through and read all the source code. It's actually really interesting, like the, some of the, the compiler architecture stuff that they did for it. It's, it's really cool. It's like 
next-gen compiler stuff. Uh, but it's implemented in TypeScript, which means that you could compile it down into JavaScript and you could run it anywhere. You could run it in any JavaScript host. Um, that means it runs on Node. You could run it in uh, Windows script host. Uh, I was kind of joking around uh, yesterday mentioning, well, can you run it in the uh, uh, Adobe JavaScript host? Like, can you run the TypeScript compiler in Photoshop? And I don't see why not. I haven't tried it yet because Photoshop is like a bajillion dollars. But um, if anyone has a license of, of CS, then you should try running TypeScript in, in, in that host. But TypeScript compiler runs just in JavaScript. So the uh, playground website on typescriptlang.org that Jonathan was using um, is all, that, that's running the actual compiler in your browser. Similar to uh, the CoffeeScript compiler, I guess, except it's actually a compiler instead of a weird kind of like regex thing that like is just kind of like doing a transform just on your code. It, it's a real compiler. Um, it's a real compiler and it has a lot of really cool stuff built into it too. Uh, all the stuff that enables all of the tooling that um, has been demonstrated in Visual Studio. That's not some proprietary Visual, Stu uh, Visual Studio stuff. Um, all of those services for type inference, for code completion suggestions, that's all services that are provided by the TypeScript compiler and there are APIs available for that. So there is nothing preventing anyone from going out and writing whatever tooling you want to for Vim or TextMate or Emacs or do people use that? Or, or Sublime Text, or whatever your favorite text editor is, or uh, directly in uh, a browser, uh, similar to what Microsoft has done. Um, so that's really cool. Jonathan went over some of this stuff. Uh, basically, TypeScript is JavaScript, and all of the stuff that maybe looks new, just um, a lot of it's based off of the upcoming ES6 proposals. There's some stuff that uh, requires um, new, uh, uh, th that you can't compile back to ES5 very well just because they're language level extensions. Um, Dominic has an excellent talk on what's coming up in ES6 and you should definitely look it up. Um, but there's a lot of stuff that's just sugar and the TypeScript compiler supports that and kind of implements it now. You get arrow functions, which are awesome uh, because you don't have to type function, and I'm slow at typing, uh, and they make things clean. Uh, you get the class keyword, which maybe you like it, maybe you don't like it, but that's not a TypeScript thing, that's an ES6 thing. And the other cool thing is you don't have to use it. Uh, modules, so again, it's not exactly the, the ES6 module proposal, it's kind of like one of several competing proposals. Um, it's all right. I mean, use it or don't use it. Just keep writing regular requires. Uh, okay, so you get rest arguments. This is really cool. This is when you're writing a, a function and you have um, some stuff up front and then an arbitrary number of uh, like parameters afterwards. Uh, normally, you'd have to do like kind of some janky like uh, array dot prototype dot slice dot call arguments type of deal and then like do some like parsing stuff and like start indexing like after like the, the second uh, element of your arguments array that you've created and you don't have to do that anymore. Um, ES6 uh, has it built into the language and TypeScript will just compile it and do all that nasty array prototype junk for you. Uh, they don't implement spread though which is the, the way that you would apply stuff without having to explicitly call apply which doesn't make sense and TypeScript people Go do that. <laughs> Go implement that. Uh, the really awesome bits of TypeScript aren't, aren't the sugar parts. Um, optional static typing. Type inference is, it, it just works. And it works really, really well. Um, like in the demo Jonathan showed, you don't have to do anything different in your code. You don't have to have any TypeScript artifacts in line in your code but you get all the benefits of it if you uh, are predisposed to use that kind of tooling and, and auto-completion stuff. And uh, when you're consuming other languages or, or, or other uh, APIs, um, for example, the DOM API is huge and really, really nasty um, and is one of the main reasons for jQuery's success, I think, because the DOM API sucks so much. Um, well, 
but you know that maybe you should be using the DOM because it's vanilla JS and it's trendy and there's performance benefits or whatever. So having that kind of auto completion on the straight DOM is really nice. Uh, and then also, especially as a bunch of the new HTML5 APIs are coming out around uh, a lot of really cool stuff that you could do in the browser, like uh, WebRTC and Web Audio and, and um, WebGL, all these types of things. Being able to have a really nice inline API reference uh, is really cool. The type system itself is really nice. So I don't know how many of you how many of you have experience in uh, statically compiled languages, or especially I'm thinking like Java or .NET type of thing. Okay, so about about two thirds of you. Um, doesn't polymorphism suck? Doesn't doesn't hierarchical uh, type inheritance really like maybe it's not bad when you're working in that but then when you've been doing JavaScript for a while and you're used to just like doing things like mixing things in and monkey patching things wherever you want maybe that's really bad maybe it's really cool but it's really flexible and and it's really nice and you don't have to like redefine all sorts of weird stuff um, so in TypeScript what I mean by a structure based type system is it's duct typing so you don't uh, a function doesn't have to explicitly implement an interface it's implicit if the function has the same method signature that the interface is expecting for example or if an object has the same uh, properties defined on it that the interface specifies so you could have an object or a function that implements uh, multiple interfaces without having to declare like a combinatorially exploding number of, of kind of derived interfaces just to be able to, to use things uh, in different places but still have the benefits of the static analysis from having uh, those interfaces. And if you don't know what any of that meant then that's awesome and you're lucky never to have had to work in classical OO. Uh, the other really nice thing about it is that it's based on uh, JavaScript primitive types. So Defining uh, an interface in TypeScript is, um, you're working with the primitives you already know. You're working with Booleans, you're working with numbers, you're working with uh, strings and functions and regexes and, and or well, not functions, but objects. Um, it, it just works. It, it feels really JavaScripty. It feels really terse. Um, I like it. There are alternatives if you want to define your interfaces in some other format. Uh, but they're bad. There's a couple of things that I just don't understand. Um, Booleans uh, are called bool. What, why not just use the same string that type of is going to give you? I, I don't get that. Fortunately, the semantics are identical. It's hard to mess up something that is a bit. Um, there are no generics yet. They've kind of alluded to it in the formal spec, and I really hope that they prioritize like a lot of resources because it makes it so much more useful if I could reason about my uh, API in JavaScript in terms of a function returning a promise of a type or a stream of a type. Because if I don't have this, then it means that I lose the type inference flowing throughout my system really quick. Uh, I, I use promises a lot. I think they're cool. Um, and unfortunately, with the current implementation of the TypeScript uh, uh, type inference system, we don't get these. So that would be really nice to have. Reference declarations. OK, let's sit down and, and we're going to write some TypeScript and we're going to import the node uh, declarations. Uh, the first thing you got to do, let's write some XML. What? Uh, so the syntax for that, maybe you saw that, that was, um, uh, that's the stuff where you do, whoa, 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 what? Uh, references uh, path equals thing what um, typically I think you would be wanting to import the the references alongside uh, importing a module so I think that they could do some work on um, improving that so if you're importing a module that has the the type space the TypeScript declarations in line in the implementation of the module, then you get that. But if you're implementing or requiring a module that is uh, pure JavaScript, for example, then you would have to have that uh, kind of side loading of references. And it's just really inelegant, I think. 
And then there's some other WTFs which are kind of like less uh, te technical based, but maybe I think are really big barriers to adoption. Uh, the documentation right now is really bad. You go on typescriptlang.org and there's some code examples and there's a formal spec. Very cool that they have a formal spec, um, but it's not good for kind of reference. Also, it's only in uh, Word doc and PDF format. There's no HTML version of the spec, uh, which is another kind of, huh? And, and it also means that you can't link to it like in conversation, so that's really dumb. Um, Codeplex. Who here is, like, has a Codeplex account and like, checks it on a regular basis? There's like, more than zero people, which is proof that we're in Seattle, Washington. <laughs> Code, Codeplex is all right. I mean, it has a decent feature set, um, but that's not where the community is. And if you want the community to, to take off around Codeplex, or, or around TypeScript, rather, then I think that the Microsoft people need to go to where the developers are and not expect developers to say, hey, I'm going to start participating in Codeplex issue threads or whatever. That's, that's not how developers are used to working. Please tell lawyers that. Uh, okay. <laughs> Uh, Non-Visual Studio tooling, um, but as I mentioned, all the services are in the compiler, so that's kind of on you guys. I think Microsoft can maybe meet the community halfway and, and adjust the first one, maybe provide better documentation around some of the service APIs to make it easier for other people to implement um, things in other environments. Um, I do have to say though, kudos to the TypeScript team for on the same day that TypeScript was released publicly, also including uh, a couple of packages for non-Visual Studio editors. So um, there is the, um, let's see, where am I? There, uh, there are syntax highlighting declarations for uh, Sublime, for example. So if I pop one of these open, uh, I get syntax highlighting uh, in TypeScript. Um, in Sublime Text, so that's kind of cool and cross-platform. For the remaining couple of minutes I have, um, I'm going to talk about a couple of things. I'm going to talk about uh, interfaces. They exist. Uh, interfaces, interfaces, interfaces. They're really important. And I don't just mean like explicit static interfaces, like I am defining this as an interface of thing this, but um, kind of like Brock was talking about in terms of decomposing your system into different modules and kind of having that contract through which different modules talk to each other and interoperate with, with each other. Uh, we re interfaces are really, really important. Interfaces are kind of like the social way that code talks to each other. So interfaces really don't matter if you're one person and you have an infinite memory for everything that you have ever written. I know in my case, like if I go back and read code that I wrote last week, it's like, who wrote this? What kind of idiot did that? Oh. Uh, it's really important to think about the, the interface. If you don't like the word interface, the API that you're writing for your modules that are going to be consumed by other places within your application, potentially other applications, if you throw it online, then other uh, people that you've never met before. And you want to make sure that those APIs are really good so that people say how nice they are instead of compare them to um, uh, DOM APIs, for example. Interfaces help with discoverability. Discoverability is something that happens on a lot of levels. And I really like Matt's point this morning that we have very finite time. So we need to figure out what modules to use, once we grab some modules that we're going to be using and programming against, I don't want to waste time having 10 different uh, module uh, documentation pages open that are in varying layers, levels of quality. Each one sort of invents their own syntax to describe what the interface is for the different functions that they pick. Um, if you're lucky, it's sane. If you're not lucky, then they just kind of say, well, here's a thing and it does kind of X and, oh, go read the implementation. Okay, great. Uh, time is, is finite, time is very valuable, and I want to work on shit that matters, not read your API docs. Um, and so in, in that case, I guess just to make it very clear, the discoverability I mean is when you're actually writing code, like heads down, you're writing code, uh, to be able to see what methods are available, what, what, um, 
what you can do with these modules in a very context specific way. Um, so I don't know what your opinions are about IDEs, but I'm a slow typer and I have a bad memory for proper nouns, so I really think that they are useful for some things. Interfaces are great for encapsulation within APIs. So just because you have 100 modules in your system doesn't mean that every module should depend on every other module, right? You want to probably stratify it into some different vertical layers of separation and then horizontal layers of orthogonal concerns within your system. So you want to make sure that um, each module is only really caring about um, as, as a, a single concern, if you can limit it to that, if you're, if you're good and smart enough to do that. Um, and I think that being forced sort of to think about your interfaces in a more explicit sense helps you have that discipline to really be strict about what is my module doing. You kind of get that when you're defining like your module.exports, dot whatever. Um, having to think about it on a finer grain level than just the function level, I think is really useful in terms of uh, kind of shaping maybe some of your design decisions of, I have this function, but this is explicitly what this function is doing. These are the well-defined inputs of this system and the well-defined outputs that I could expect. The interface is JavaScript, and the implementation language does not matter. So this is really cool. So I should be able to consume a function written in, I don't know, Erlang Haskell script and, and use it from JavaScript and not care that it's implemented in whatever, whatever, right? I, I should be able to cross-compile from, from Smalltalk to JavaScript and then just consume it from within my JavaScript uh, the kernel of my application. Or uh, there's, a, there's a bunch of things. There's um, uh, you can compile from C into JavaScript and from C Sharp and, and any language. It doesn't matter. I shouldn't have to know those languages to be able con to consume your code. Uh, and again, I guess the position I'm coming from is I want to be able to do things at the end of the day. And if there's a library out there that solves my problem, right? If there's some really great scientific computing library that's out there in Python or whatever, if they could cross compile it to JavaScript and describe the interface for me in terms of JavaScript, then I can use it and I shouldn't have to care about the implementation. I had a really great slide. The photo is lost. I will find it, though. Uh, but it is the story that I want to come back to of the Tower of Babel. Uh, the Tower of Babel. I could have wikied it faster. The gist is, and I'm going to paraphrase and, and be really ignorant about a lot of things. There's a civilization in some part of the world, and they were building a tower up to heaven so that they could challenge God and, and be really awesome and, and uh, work on shit that mattered and get shit done. Um, God didn't like that. So he's like, you're too good at building these complex systems. You're able to communicate too well, and you're able to share too much and you're able to achieve too high of a level of code reuse and too high of a level of highly cohesive modularity. So I don't like that. So I'm going to destroy your tower and I'm going to scramble your brain so you can't talk to each other. And I'm going to distribute you far and wide into the Ruby community, into the JavaScript community, into the CoffeeScript community, and all these things. And you will never be able to talk to each other. And even within your communities, you're going to be arguing about semicolons. <laughs> I don't really know what any of the religious undertones of that mean, but I think that like building like big things is really cool, and I want the ability to have that kind of lingua franca, to be able to have mutual intelligibility, to be able to be share code and modules uh, from from anywhere to anywhere, and consume everything everywhere all the time, because that's really cool, and you could combine things and do really cool things that no one ever expected you to be able to do. So you could have a robot library over here and a natural language processing library over here and one is written in whatever and I, I don't really care and JavaScript is a really cool glue language and I'm really fast at it and I could uh, do a lot of really cool things with it and suddenly the libraries I have available, uh, I could do whatever. I can import Fortran libraries that are really useful for uh, managing 
uh, nuclear reactors that are over here because scientists really like writing uh, in the formula translation language. That's cool. Now I could use it in JavaScript on my robot that is flying on a helicopter. All right. Um, end of rant. <laughs> I have a to-do list for all of you, and then we have lunch. The first is go play around with TypeScript, even just as like an academic exercise. Don't think of it as a language. Think of it as a tool. Um, go read through the 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 compiler if you want, and then try and figure out some way to, to, to decipher the API that they built around the services. It's like there's this really cool nugget and it's like locked inside of a thing, inside of a thing, inside of like a Byzantine maze. Uh, decipher that and implement it in an editor, or even just write a blog post about it to give someone else a leg up to implement it. That's a really selfish ask, but I really want that. Um, if you don't do that, be mindful of your interfaces. If you take one thing away from this, if you never touch TypeScript in your life, if your TypeScript files keep the, the .js extension, I should say, then uh, just be mindful of the interfaces that you're exporting to people. Um, if you're a library maintainer, if you write open source libraries that are going to be used by other people, um, consider creating TypeScript declarations for your libraries, even, even if your libraries are just in JavaScript. And in fact, there are really good arguments for keeping your libraries in JavaScript to make it easier for people to contribute to it. That's a totally valid thing. But having TypeScript, TypeScript declarations is making your library easier for other developers to consume. Uh, and if you don't want to write them yourself, then solicit community contributions. Uh, it would be the same as asking for help with documentation. And like Jonathan showed, um, go play around this afternoon or whatever, go to npm install tsd. And it's basically a, um, a repository for third-party TypeScript declarations. And they have things for Node, they have uh, a, a small but growing list of uh, third-party TypeScript declarations, and you can write your own. Uh, and then lastly, come and call me names or buy me beer at my Twitter thing. And let's go have lunch. I don't know what the status of lunch is, but I'll explain it. <laughs> Carter can take it away. All right. Uh, so we are all going to have lunch. Uh, what I what I, what I said before, what I said yesterday uh, uh, stands for today. If you're starving, awesome. Go outside, get in line. Uh, the truck is located a little farther down the block than it was yesterday, but it is there. I promise you, it's big and it's blue. Um, if you got some email to do, if you can wait, like whatever, just ch you know wait, uh, wait for the line to die down, and then go grab lunch. Instead of two hours, we're gonna we did a good job yesterday, so we're cutting it down to an hour and a half. So everyone be back here at 1.30 to kick things back off, and at 1.30, the big reveal for what's going on tonight. So uh, be here at 1.30. Oh, and Cheeseburger has a ton of amazing plush toys and swag. Um, go get a funny Cheeseburger plush toy, because they're hysterical, and they'll make coding so much more funny uh, in your office. Uh, okay, I'll see you guys at 1.30. <laughs>